<laughs> Good evening, folks. Thanks for being here this evening. We're going to spend just a bit of time in prayer this evening, as you came prepared to do, I'm sure. Um, and so uh, we'll hear prayer requests, ask those folks um, who are at, online and at home, uh, if they would go ahead and um, start sharing their prayer request. I'll share a couple um, as they are doing. Um, Sue Schumann's in the hospital, okay, um, and has uh, been struggling. Um, so please be praying for her and, of course, Sonny as well. Also, um, Carol Hodges shares with us from online that uh, her neighbor that she's been requesting prayer for for so long, Jan, who struggled with cancer, said that she passed away today about 1.30, so remember that family as they grieve the loss of um, their loved one. I would also ask you to pray for my mom. My mom is... is um, struggling health-wise as well. Um, she's made a couple of visits to the emergency room. She's home now, but struggling with um, uh, just some infections and um, temperature they can't seem to control. So I uh, would appreciate you praying for, for my mom. Okay, how can we pray for you? Yes, Terry. Okay, now tell me again the relationship. She's a co-worker. She's a co-worker, okay. Okay, a co-worker of Terry's who hasn't been, or, or was thinking maybe she'd have to have a heart valve replacement, but hasn't had, uh, and so. Okay, so she's avoided the, the surgery and the heart valve replacement and all of that. Yeah, yeah, well, that, we're, we're, we're grateful that she didn't have to have the heart valve replaced. Sure, sure. Okay. Yes, Kathy? Okay. Okay, so pray for Cheryl and Jody as Cheryl faces surgery and Jody will have to negotiate and navigate <laughs> for a little while without without Cheryl. So, sure. Okay. Someone else? Liz? Okay, sure. Liz Sarver's dad, who's I've been widowed just recently. Pray that he continues to be able to negotiate life, navigate through life without a mate. Bill? Okay, so tell me again, Bill. Okay. Uh huh. Okay. Okay. It's time to get back in the saddle. <laughs> Bill will be preaching um, in one of the local churches here in town this week, and so he asked us to pray uh, that the Lord would use him in that congregation's life. And so we certainly will do that, Bill. Okay. Sure, George. George Morgan's 
unsaved children and grandchildren. Um, ask us to pray for him and Charlotte and their extended family, also our nation, our shut-ins, and especially Norma Linsky, who continues to struggle health-wise. So, as you can probably tell this evening, my throat's a little weak. Um, been struggling with a, a cold, and uh, but uh, doing okay. Um, just um, may be in for a short lesson this evening. So, okay. Anyone else? Yes, Greg. Okay. Okay, Susie, as she deals with some medical issues and tests, um, so pray for her next week. Um, Patty Harvey just reminds us, and I hear the, the rain coming here, that there's uh, thunderstorms in the forecast this evening, severe, and so... Uh, Pray for safety, uh, every one of those storms roll through. Patty Wilson asked us to remember her friend, Tina Weaver, um, and uh, who just learned that her husband has cancer, uh, or just lost her husband to cancer, I guess it is. So um, pray for Tina Weaver, Patty's friend. Tim, give us an update on uh, your father-in-law. wonderful testimony. So Art Langdon, I think, is, is Tim's father-in-law's name, so pray for Art as he struggles health-wise, but certainly is flourishing spiritually from what I understand. So we thank God for people like that. Okay. Yes, Brenda? Okay. Sure. Okay. Unsaved folks in the Dow's family, please be praying for them. Also, Brenda has a sister who has a friend in Wisconsin um, struggling with um, cancer. And so please be praying. And I believe the friend's name was Barbara. And so please be praying for Barbara in Wisconsin. Is that it? Then let's pray together. Roger, would you mind leading us, please?
Amen. Thank you, Roger. Also, I'm sure that most of you have heard of the shooting that took place down at, in front of the Crossroads Mall there. I, I certainly be praying for those officers that were involved in that and then the victim um, who lost his life. Um, pray for his family. Um, I know that's got to be a tragedy. And uh, so I don't know the circumstances, I don't know the situation or anything sort, but I know that that's um, a difficult way uh, to go out of this world. And so please pray for his family as well. Okay, if you have your Bibles, let's, let's return to the book of Nehemiah. We're going to be looking at chapters 11 and chapter 12. And if you look at chapter 11 and chapter 12, um, you've got to be wondering how in the world do we preach anything out of these chapters? Because it is primarily a list of names. Um, but I think that they are there for a reason and a cause. Um, many of the names that are listed there are, first of all, hard to pronounce because they're Hebrew. And most of the names that are there, you've never heard of. And this would be the only place in the Bible where these people are mentioned. But what a joy it will be to, to meet uh, Beth Pellet and um, Ziklag and in Rimnon. Um, what, what a, you know, Zara, uh, Meshazezebel, you know. Um, can you imagine strolling through heaven and meeting one of these folks and he comes up and introduces himself to you and you say, well, who are you? And he says, well, I'm in the book of Nehemiah. That's where my name is. You know, I mean, what an honor it would be to have your name listed in the eternal word of God as a servant of the Lord. And that's basically what we have here, folks is a listing of all of these names. Um, and I don't think that it is by accident that they are here. I know it's not, because every word we believe is inspired of God. And so, <clears throat> what an honor it is to have your name listed there, even though this is the only place that it's listed, and we don't know anything about your family, your history, uh, your accomplishments in life, your status, other than what we're told here in these chapters and in many instances it's just a listing of uh, your name and who your father was or who you descended from. And that's what we have here for the most part. However, I think that there is something that is beyond just what we see here on the surface in this list of names that we need to, li that we need to um, glean and learn from. Okay. Ronnie, you may have to be my flipper tonight. I guess my batteries are dead more ways than one. There we go. Okay. Um, what we see here, folks, is a list of names of people that served God in a sacrificial way. And serving the Lord and being a child of God has always required a sacrifice. Um all the way back the book of Genesis in chapter 3 after the fall before there could be a, um, a meeting uh, between God and Adam and Eve um, there had to be a sacrifice and an animal lost his life because of their sin and it's been that way from that point all the way until today serving the Lord, being a child of God being in a relationship with the Lord requires a sacrifice. Um, and here is a list of people who made some tremendous sacrifices 
in order to be listed as a servant of the Lord. Um, for just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. And so it takes every one of us, and it takes all of us. And that's what we need to remember as we look at this. First of all, it takes all of us. If we're going to rebuild and see strong ministries carrying the gospel to the lost, discipling those that are saved for the work of the ministry in this community, in this town, in this church, sacrifices have got to be made. And those sacrifices have got to be shared across the entire body. All of us. It takes all of us. Everyone and then every part. Take a look, if you would, as they're listed here, beginning in verse 1. Now the leaders of the people who lived in Jerusalem, but the rest of the people cast lots to bring one out of ten to live in Jerusalem, the holy city, while nine-tenths remained in the other cities. And all the people blessed all the men who volunteered to live in Jerusalem. So there was volunteers and then there were draftees. Understand the significance of this. Jerusalem is the capital of Israel. And if the capital is desolate and people are afraid to come and live inside the city, even though they've rebuilt the wall, to provide security for the city dwellers, if the people are afraid to come in there and live, what kind of testimony is that to the rebuilding of the wall? And beyond that, to the God of the people. And so Nehemiah understood that the city needs to be repopulated. And obviously there were some people who said, we'll move. We'll move. And they moved into the city. Verse 2 says, and the people blessed all the men who volunteered to live in Jerusalem. There were people who volunteered to uproot and move into the city to be a testimony to the faithfulness and the goodness and the strength of God. Think about that. That's not something that's easily done. This is a truth. When we moved from Northern Virginia to West Virginia, every article, everything I owned fit into half of the garage. We have a two-car garage, and it was about 30 days before we could go to settlement. The gentleman I was buying the house from was kind enough to tell me, you don't have to, you know, we had to be out of our house in Northern Virginia before we could move into the house that we bought here in West Virginia. He said, don't go rent a storage unit or anything like that. He said, I'll just give you a, a garage door opener and you can put your stuff here in the garage. And he cleaned out half of the garage for us. We put everything that we owned in there, everything from lawnmowers to a couch, every blessed thing that we owned, we put it in half of that garage. You couldn't move me with a freight train now. It would be a task to load everything up that I've got. I mean, it wouldn't take one tractor and trailer. It would take more. We've, over the 30 years that we've been here, 30 plus years, we've accumulated a lot of stuff. Now, it's all good junk, okay? But for me to uproot and move would be a task. And yet there were people who saw the need of doing that in order to be a testimony to the faithfulness and the strength and the goodness of God. And others blessed them for doing that. And the people blessed all the men who volunteered to live in Jerusalem. And so, if the Lord asks you, <laughs> uproot and move in order to be a testimony 
to my faithfulness, my goodness, and to be used of me in another part of the country or another region of the world, that would be a task. It'd be something to, to, to be done. But there were those who did it. But apparently there was not enough people to, to satisfy uh, the space, to fill the space. And so they cast lots. They put their name in a hat, and you drew it out. If you got the short straw or the black marble or whatever it was, however they cast lots, whatever they did to cast lots, and nine or one out of ten, a tithe of the people. <laughs> Would you put your name in the hat? You know, I ain't going to volunteer, but okay, I'll put my name in the hat. That's what these people did. This is how committed they were. Remember the last time we were together and we looked at chapter 10, I believe it was, chapter 10, and they signed on the dotted line. Ladies and gentlemen, we cannot build a church and we cannot rebuild a church without commitment and people who are willing to make sacrifices. You cannot serve the Lord as a matter of convenience. That's not the way it works. That's not what God requires. And these people were able to accomplish what they accomplished in a short period of time because they were committed. The Word of God is what convicted them. Don't forget that. After the wall was built, they had Ezra to bring the Word out. They read the Word. They were convicted in their hearts. And at the end of that, they said, Draw up a contract and we'll sign it. And they put their name on the dotted line. And then this is, this is followed up. They're willing to make these sacrifices. The same thing is required of us in 2022, folks. If we are not committed, first of all, if we're not convicted by the truth of God's word, that leads to a commitment that prompts us to make a sacrifice, then ministries cannot be built and ministries cannot be rebuilt. That's what it requires. And that's why we have this testimony of these people. They did a great thing. And it is recorded for us in the Word of God. And then we get a glimpse into their hearts to see how they did it and why they did it. But it didn't just stop with royalty and leadership. I believe I'm on the tail end of this thing, so it won't last long, I don't believe. <clears throat> I think I'm going to outdo it. But look at verses 4 through 9. And what do you see here? In this list, some of the sons of Judah and some of the sons of Benjamin lived in Jerusalem. Why is Benjamin and Judah se separated out? What, what is, what is, what's the tribe of Judah? Who comes from the tribe of Judah? The Messiah. That's the royal line, okay? The first king, Saul, from the tribe of Benjamin. They're the warrior tribe. They're the, they're the, they're the leadership. And so there was no exemptions, okay? Your status or your family, you didn't get, you didn't get exempted, all right? Royalty and leadership. They're listed right there among the folks who were making these sacrifices because of commitment that stemmed out of their conviction. But then, valiant and mighty men. Uh, drop on down to verse 6. All the sons of Perez lived in Jerusalem, were 468 able men. Now these are the sons of Benjamin, and so on, and, and, and they're, they're all listed. And, and then drop down to verse uh, 14. And their brothers, valiant warriors... 
and their overseer was Zabdiel, the son of, oh, uh, you go ahead and say it. Okay? And so there's, you know, there's warriors. There's, you know, those who keep the peace, those who protect the city. And then if you keep on reading on down through there, folks, there's priests and Levites. There's temple workers. There were those that facilitated the service and the worship of God. There were those who taught the word of God. And then there were those that worked on the buildings and kept the grounds up. Everybody's needed. Everybody's needed. There are folks who say, well, I, I'm just, you know, I'm, I, I don't have anything to do. That's simply because you haven't looked around long enough. And you know what? Here's another thing, folks. People oftentimes will ask me, what can I do? Well, I don't know. Can you drive a nail? Can you sweep a floor? Can you teach a class? Can you, you know, there's, there's any place in the world for you to serve. And, and, my, and I don't mean that to be sarcastic, and I don't mean to thwart people's um, enthusiasm or investigation of a place to serve the Lord. I don't mean to sound that way, and if I do, I apologize. But my question is often, what do you like to do? What do you like to do? And, you know, are you artistic? Are you musical? Um, you know, do you like to serve in the background? Can you cook? Can, you know, what can you do? No matter what it is, I'll guarantee you, there's a way that you can use it to magnify the name of Christ. You know? Um, are, are you, you know, can you speak? Can you talk? Can you say hello, welcome? We'll put you up out front, you know? Um, if you're warm and breathing, there's a place for you. And it takes all of us. And God did not save you to be a mole or a wart, okay? And for sure, he didn't save you to be a festered hare. That's a joke. I'll tell it slower next time. Okay? You fit. You fit. And it takes every one of us. There's nobody left out. And as you move down through this list, and this, this is not an extensive list, folks. This is just a cursory reading. But just look at the diversity that's there. Take your Bibles now and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And I want to I want to read verses 14 through 23. In order to save my voice, I'm going to ask Tim if he would. Tim, would you stand right where you are and just read that out for us? 1 Corinthians 12 beginning at verse 14. Follow along with Tim as he reads all the way down through verse 23. Yeah. What, what, what part of your body do you want to just give up and it doesn't function? 
you know, um, we can live without some parts, all right? And some of us are. You know, some of you lost your tonsils a long time ago, maybe an appendix or what have you. But, you know, whenever we go start, start talking about liver and lungs and those kinds of things, those are, those are, well, even if you're living without a part of your body, um, and, you, and you can live and you can function, um, you don't function as well. You know, cut your big toe off. See how fast you can run. I guarantee you it'll put a hitch in your giddy up. Uh, you know, every part's needed. The same thing is true with the body of Christ. When he saved you, by an, act, by an act of the Holy Spirit of God, he placed you into that body. And if you're not functioning within the body, then we're weaker because of that. Some folks have likened the body of Christ to a chain, to say that we are only as strong as our weakest link. I hope that's not true. Because if Maximal Hill Baptist Church is only as strong as its weakest member, then we're in a world of hurt, aren't we? Okay? So I don't think we should look at us in that way. But if we were to look at us as a solution, okay? Say a saline solution. You are either causing that solution to become stronger or you're watering it down and making it weaker. But we are a combination of all that we bring, all that God has gifted us with. And then, even if you're a very gifted person, if you're not functioning and you're not using that gift, then you are actually adding to the weakness of the body. And, you know, I know that, that I say this, and I know that some people perhaps... Um, think of it as just being lighthearted. I, I'm not being lighthearted. I'm being dead serious when I say this. But whenever the Lord adds new members to this church, I say to them, huh, we've been missing you. You are a body part that God has brought and added to us. And we are looking forward to how you're going to make us a stronger body. There's, there's, church is not a spectator sport. It's not. And we cannot be spectators. I mean, think about it. Um, in a football, in an NFL football game, on any given Sunday, there's only 22 men out there on the field that's playing at any one given time. Okay. And those men are finely tuned athletes. I mean, they can run fast, they can jump high, they can throw long and catch impossible passes, okay? I mean, they are fine physical specimens, but there are only 22 of them that can play the game. Sometimes there's as many as 40,000 people of the flabbiest, softest, softest, most out of shape people in the world that have ever come there to watch these finely tuned athletes. That's not a picture of the church. And yet, folks, sometimes I think that that's the way we think of church, is that I come to watch the show. Okay? And a lot of times, this is one of the ways that people will even choose a church. The better show that's presented, that's... Look, don't choose a church for what you get out of it. That's not the way... Because, listen, if that's your mentality and if that's the way you're thinking, then you're thinking wrong. Because that's a parasitic mentality. You're taking something away. Look, this is not... This is not a smorgasbord... And I know all these pitch, you know, from NFL to smorgasbord now. Okay, I'm mixing my metaphors. But that's okay. I'm trying to get a point across here. This is not a smorgasbord where you can come in and you just take a little of this, but I don't want none of that. Take a little of this. Mm -mm, I, don't, I don't like that stuff. No, it's not that. We're not a smorgasbord. We are a potluck dinner 
You bring your pot, you put it on the table. Everybody else brings their pot. And when everybody does that, everybody goes home satisfied. Everybody goes home satisfied. <laughs> Somebody trying to call me on Facebook here. They just trying to log on and hit the wrong button. That's all right. That's all right. Okay. But, but no, that's, you bring something and you offer it and you take a little bit of what somebody else brought and everybody goes home satisfied. Nobody goes home hungry. And that's the way we are, folks. And that's what we see here. And this is how this great work was accomplished. Everybody. Everybody participated. But not only that, folks, but it takes every part of us. Every part of us. A physical presence, okay? There needed to be warm bodies in the city. There needed to be a physical presence. There is strength in numbers. You come to church and the, and the place is full and we sing and, you know, the, the windows vibrate with our voices. How encouraging is that? Okay? And you see folks that you haven't seen all week or maybe you haven't seen in a while. How encouraging is that? Jerusalem needed warm bodies in it. And there needs to be warm bodies in the pew. So don't discount your physical presence. When I moved here 30 some years ago, I've told you this story before, but some of you need to hear it again. And some of you online need to hear it. Mr. Plumley, Mr. Plumley was deaf. I visited with him on his porch and you had to yell into his ear to get him to understand you. And he told me, he said, I don't understand one thing you say whenever you're up there preaching. And that was, you know, I'm, I'm, all right, never heard anybody tell me that. But so I asked him, I said, well, Mr. Plumley, why do you keep coming to church? He said, because my neighbors need to see me going to church. Okay? His physical presence was all that he could offer at that stage of his life. But he didn't neglect that. And so there is a physical presence. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. You guys can recite this, I'm sure. Paul said to the Romans, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your, your bodies... That word is soma, and it means just exactly that, your bodies. The Bible has a lot to say about our bodies. Tim, you've done such a good job reading for us a while ago. Why don't you go to Romans chapter 6 and begin reading at verse 13, down through verse 19, if you don't mind. Romans chapter 6, verses 13 through 19. To 19. Your physical presence, folks, is, is a major part of your being. It's a major part of your, 
of, of your human experience and being created in the image of God. And Paul here exhorts these people to present their members. What's he talking about? Their physical being. Use your hands to do the work of the Lord. Use your mouth to exalt the Lord Christ, to share the gospel with the lost. Use your feet. Use your physical presence for the glory of God. Jerusalem needed warm bodies. And Nehemiah took steps to encourage these people to fulfill that need. And so don't discount. Don't discount your physical presence and what your presence does for others. But you see, folks, if we've got this mentality of I come to church to get out of it what I can, no, it's okay to take something. That's all right. We're not going to begrudge you that. But bring something to us. Don't be a parasite. You bring something. And sometimes that's all you can bring is your physical presence. And that's okay. That's all right. We won't begrudge that either. But sometimes we just need you to be here. Not only that, but there was an emotional presence that they offered as well. Drop down to verse 31 of chapter 12. Then I had the leaders of Judah come up on top of the wall and I appointed two great choirs, the first proceeding to the right on top of the wall toward the refuse gate. So two great choirs were assembled. And Nehemiah put them up on top of the wall, and he said, all right, you boys, you guys, you gals, you all head down that way, okay? And then there's a list of names that, uh, that, uh, that, that's there, okay? And the other... Uh, the second choir, down to verse 38 now, the second choir proceeded to the left while I followed them with half of the people on the wall. <laughs> and then if you keep on reading, go down to verse 43, I think it is. Yes, and on that day they offered great sacrifices and rejoiced because God had given them great joy. Even the women and the children rejoiced so that the joy of Jerusalem was heard from afar. These folks created such a commotion and they got so loud and so exuberant in their worship that it was heard from afar. Now, there were some people who were really into this, evidently. And imagine this now. Just imagine this. Here they are up on the wall. Why did Nehemiah put them up on the wall? That's what was built. That was the whole purpose. They needed to touch it. They needed to see it. They needed to, to, to put their hands on it. And then, man, they marched. And, and you can imagine, as they, as they went out of hearing of one another, and, you know, as they, as they began to come back together, you can imagine this crescendo of worship as these two choirs joined together at some midpoint in that wall and around that city so that everybody around them heard them, everybody around them saw. And this was, this was no small gathering, and this was not some kind of a ritual. I mean, these people were into it. This was something that was impacting and affecting every part of their body and every part of their being. Their joy was great. Have you, ever, have you ever had that experience? Let me tell you this, this true story, okay? Um, many of you know that, that my son is a musician, and whenever he was at, uh, I believe it was at uh, Cincinnati uh, Conservatory of Music, he was in an opera. Um, can't remember the name of it. But anyway, I'd never been to operas until he started singing in them, okay? I didn't know the first thing about them. But this was a really big production, okay? 
And there were, there were some well-known opera singers who were in attendance and who were part of Anyway, he had the lead part, and there were two, two, um, two productions. We went to the first one, and I didn't know the first thing about what was going on. Of course, it's in Italian. They have the thing going on up there. You can read what's, you know, what the actors are saying on stage. And, you know, and, and the, right in the middle of a song, there would be people who would break out into bravo, brava, you know, and all of this. And I don't know what's going on. And then whenever the, you know, whenever the song was over, I'd get ready to clap. And nobody was clapping. So I didn't, you know. So when we got home that evening, I asked him, I said, Seth, I, I didn't understand what, you know, how, how do you know when to holler bravo and how do you know when to clap and all this? And so he was giving me some pointers about this particular opera. And he told me, he said, Dad, he said, he told me where his voice coach and his stage coach would be um, sitting in, in the audience the next night. And he said, you watch those guys. And he said, whenever, he, he told me what part he would be singing, you know, and where it was at in the, in the production and the play and all this. And he said, now, if, and, and, and I remembered where he was talking about, he said, now, if I hit that note and I, you know, really just ring the rafters, boy, you know, then there, if, if those two guys, it still gets me excited. If those two guys get up out of their seat and they're hollering bravo, you'll know I'd done what I was supposed to do. So now I'm educated, okay? And I'm sitting there, and, and, and he got, because he's one of the people on the, in the, you know, he's one of the performers, we get down there in the good seats. And, I mean, we're just a few rows back from the stage. And there's a little lady that's sitting beside of me, and she has them little opera glasses. See, she's already educated. She already knows what's going on. She's been there before. This is my first trip. And, and you know, I'm ready for it now. And whenever he comes out on stage and, and you know, he's singing that part and, and, you know, the music is building up and he, boy, I mean, he hits that note and the place just goes nuts, you know. And I look over there and there is uh, one of those guys that sings regularly at the Metropolitan Opera, okay. I mean, he's a big dude. He's a muckety-muck, you know. I mean, he's up there. And he is standing on his feet and he is applauding my son and he is saying, bravo, bravo, okay. I'm telling you, folks, I lost it, okay? I got caught up in the moment. And I grabbed that little woman by the arm, and I said, that's my boy. Scared her to death. She sat like this the rest of the, the, rest of the opera. <laughs> True story, folks. True story. I'm not exaggerating a bit. I got home, and I told Seth what I'd done. He said, Dad, you didn't. I said, I did, boy. <laughs> And I ain't ashamed of none of it. <laughs> okay? But, folks, you know, these people are into it. And, and, and it's, it's impacting at the core of their being. There's great rejoicing going on here. There's great rejoicing. So there's an emotion. There's a spiritual presence as well. And we're running out of time. I told you this was going to be short, and I lied again. But... 44 through 45, these people were giving out of their heart. They were supporting with their financial uh, uh, gifts and abilities and resources. They wanted to see this thing go forward. And you can read that for yourself, how that they were giving. There was a spiritual... And, and, and let me tell you this. Let me tell you this. When this is coming out of conviction, okay... When the word of God speaks to your heart, it's coming, it's, 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 it's at the deepest level of your being. And that leads to a commitment. And then the sacrifices that are offered, yeah, they're sacrifices. But they hardly hurt at all. They hardly hurt at all. Because that's, the way the body of Christ operates, folks. That's the way this wall was built. That's the way that this place was. And that's how that we will rebuild the ministries of our church and our community. But it'll take every one of us, and it'll take all of us. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for loving us. Thank you for uh, being willing to be patient with us, to work with our hearts, work with our being, and change us where we need to be changed. 
um, teach us where we need to be taught. And Father, then I pray that that work would be so complete and it would be so um, full that we indeed could uh, engage with you in the pursuit of your will with our total being. Lord, build your church in accordance with your word, your truth, and according to your will. And thank you for allowing us to be a part of that. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. God bless you, folks. Thank you for being here. And uh, appreciate you putting up with, with me. <laughs> God bless you. Good night. Those of you that are online, thanks for joining us. And uh, you guys stay safe and stay faithful. <laughs>